Assalamualaikum, everyone. Welcome to Academic Access. Uh, this week, I am very honored um, to have none other than Dr. Basil Atai, who is joining us for this week's uh, show. Dr. Basil Atai, welcome to Academic Access. Thank you. I'm right. delighted to be with you. Uh, we are Dr. absolutely delighted to have you. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Basil Atai, at least for me, when I was first getting into the whole discussion of Islam and science, I came across his works uh, in particular uh, in the very early stage of my journey. This is the book that I uh, stumbled upon. And I was also very fortunate enough to have met you in Malaysia. That was the first time we, we met in person, right? That's right. Um, Yes. Kalam, yeah, Kalam Research and Media, they were organizing a conference there. But before we get into, you know, um, your work, uh, Dr. Vassal, so he's written these two fantastic books, which you're going to be discussing, guys. Uh, before we get into that, uh, I was wondering if you could kind of explain, you know, who is Dr. Vassal Atai? How did you reach to the position that you are today? So, you know, you um, people know you as wearing multiple hats. You know, you do Kalam, you're, you know, a physics professor. I mean, how did you get to this stage today? And what are you doing continuously on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, actually, from the very early stages of my life, uh, I w was very fascinated with two, two subjects, physics and philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's from secondary school time. And uh, the thing which attracted my attention was the theory of relativity. I started reading books uh, in Arabic and in English also during my, when I was 16 actually. And uh, I, I had a good habit, uh, uh, and that is to make summaries of uh, what I read mm -hmm. uh, normally. So I have my own notebooks, which I write about what I read. Later mm -hmm. on, when I started my university, uh, University of Mosul in 1970, uh, uh, we had a small group of intellectual uh, int uh, students, actually, who are very much interested in uh, philosophy and physics also. Some of them are uh, colleagues in physics department. And we started, uh, funnily enough, to read the book of Al-Ghazali, The Incoherence of the Philosophers, All right, along, okay. with, along with the book of Ibn Rushd, Averroes, the uh, 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 incoherence of the incoherence. Right. Uh, and we had, uh, we meet twice a week uh, for about two hours. We discuss these books. Uh, step by step, we covered large portion of both books, actually. And some of us started writing their own essays, etc., etc. But by the age of 20, when I was... Uh, actually in the second or third year, physics, I wrote a book about the theory of special relativity and general relativity. Mm -hmm. And the book was uh, submitted to, I submitted to the university, uh, who we had a very marvelous uh, president of the University of Mosul, Muhammad al mashat his name, Dr. Muhammad al mashat He is a sociologist, actually. And he encouraged me, uh, uh, encouraged me to, to the level of giving me an office uh, while being an undergraduate student. Obviously, this didn't apply. Many, many of the, <laughs> uh, the staff didn't like this because I am undergraduate student. How could I get an office uh, in the middle of the department? Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, uh, I uh, paid back by writing my book on relativity while I was in my third year student, actually. And it was sent to a referee uh, without names, without anything. And the referee uh, uh, endorsed the book and the content, praised it, and uh, suggested it should be published by the University of Mosul. And it was published when I was only uh, uh, in my fourth year, actually. Wow. Yeah, in the beginning of the fourth year physics. You know, I went to physics with uh, enthusiasm. It's not like uh, nowadays most of people go to physics or chemistry when they, don't, when they cannot go to the medical college. I had the, the uh, average of being in the medical college among maybe the first uh, 
a few. Uh, mm. my, my, my average in the secondary school qualified me for a medical college, but I didn't go to the medical college. <laughs> I prefer to go to physics. Yeah, and that's how I... I uh, uh, the book gave me a very uh, great inspiration, and I was uh, obviously this uh, among the, the first uh, three in physics, and I was given a scholarship. Uh, immediately after my BSc, I left to uh, Manchester University in 1974, where I started uh, my uh, postgraduate studies uh, in the Department of Theoretical Physics. Mm -hmm. uh, I did uh, actually a diploma, uh, not a not an MSc, I did a diploma, uh, examined courses, plus a, a small dissertation. Uh, in, and then I started my, I, that, that qualified me to go into the PhD program. Uh, in 75, I started my PhD, uh, actually September or October 75, I started my PhD program and I, I finished within two and a half years, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Yes. I published three papers. My, my PhD is... Uh, in in uh, the very early uh, moments of uh, the creation of the universe. It's even pre-Big Bang stage, actually. Hmm. What we call the Casimir. Not many people talk about this. Uh, normally, if you uh, meet anybody from the uh, cosmology or astrophysics and ask him about the beginning of the universe, he will start with the Big Bang. We go before the Big Bang, actually. Uh, very short time, yes, before the Big Bang, but this is very important time. But uh, no, very few people can go into this subject because you, at this stage of the very, very, very early universe, uh, you have to bring in the theory of generativity, statistical mechanics, quantum field theory, uh, and uh, uh, thermodynamics. You have to bring all this uh, and particle physics maybe in one pot in order to talk about uh, the very early universe at that stage. Mm -hmm. So I did uh, three, pay, uh, my PhD thesis was titled Vacuum Energy and Bose-Einstein Condensation in Einstein Universe. Three chapters, and the two chapters were published before my graduation, and the third chapter published in a paper. Two papers in Physical Review D, and uh, one paper in Journal of Physics of the Institute of Physics. Also a prestigious journal. And so it was a good start for me, actually. And then immediately I went back to Iraq, but I was a bit unfortunate, you know. I went back in 78, at the end of 1978, I starting with 79. In 1980, we, we had the unfortunate war with, you know, Iran-Iraq war, which uh, took eight years. And I had to do, during that time, my military, compulsory military service. Mm. And that, during which I, I feel it was a lost time. I couldn't do much research, although I published some work, but then I regained my uh, capacity uh, to work uh, until 1999. Uh, we had, uh, unfortunately, you know, the, the problem of the second Gulf War, which is the Kuwait. Kuwait. <laughs> and yeah. and we, we stayed for about, uh, also 13 years in sanctions, etc. We cannot even attend conferences. We cannot go to... Uh, but nevertheless, I did some work. And by 1999, I went to Jordan. Mm -hmm. I had to leave Iraq and I, I got an offer from Yarmouk University in Jordan, 20 years ago, exactly. And in September 1999, I went to Jordan and... Uh, 
uh, joined uh, Yarmouk University, which is the second university in Jordan. Uh, then I could really publish decent work again in, in cosmology, I mean, in quantum field theory. This is the part of the specialized physics, uh, specializing physics. Mm -hmm. But if you ask me uh, what brought you to philosophy, well, as I said, it is an old interest in philosophy. And by 1989, I read uh, about Mutakallimun, actually. If you know the, the author, uh, well-known Arabic author, Muhammad Abd al-Jabri, he has a critique of the Arabic reason. Is a, is a good book, actually. But uh, unfortunately, he went uh, the wrong way in the analysis. Why? Because he's not a physicist. Mm. He, he took the mutakallimun, and I discovered uh, the, the physics of Kalam through Abd al-Jabri, actually. Then I went, obviously, to the original books of the mutakallimun. Mutakallimun, perhaps people who are... Uh, uh, listening to us do not know what who are they mutakallimun are a gr group of uh, muslim uh, theologians and thinkers who started their work uh, or their discussions in mosques of obviously at that time in the second uh, century after hijra hmm. uh, that's the 8th century uh, id and uh, uh, they actually started with discussing uh, natural philosophy in the beginning. Mm -hmm. For about uh, a few decades, the subject turned into discussing theological questions. In fact, as far as I can see, Mutakallimun uh, had a good base uh, in natural philosophy. And they were to present their theological beliefs uh, uh, in the framework of this natural philosophy. But mind you, their approach is not philosophical. Their approach starts from God through the mind to understand nature. By God, I mean they start from the revelations. Uh, through mind and then understanding to understand nature. Uh, the philosophers actually do it the other way around. They start from nature, from the world, to through the mind, to devise a model for God. That's why sometimes you find philosophers uh, have very absurd uh, characteristics or uh, tributes of mm -hmm. God, sometimes many gods, not one God. Uh, the Mutakallimun started from Tawheed, from the first, from the, the Quran, actually. But they kept the Quran in their background. They didn't uh, use Quranic verses to argue. No, they argued rationally. Their arguments are presented with a full rational uh, prospect and uh, argumentation. Uh, but uh, you can see that their principles are brought from the Quran. Mm -hmm. The Mutakallimun was very uh, interesting for me because most of their natural philosophy turned out to be agreement in agreement with modern physics, with, with the quantum theory and, uh, and uh, relativity theory. I mean, if I would have talked about the principles of Mutakallimun in, in the subject or in the part which is called Daqiq al-Kalam, uh, their work actually is divided into two sections uh, or two trends, you can say two subjects. Daqiq al-Kalam, which deals with natural philosophy, to topics of natural philosophy, um, uh, space, time, matter, uh, atomism, uh, causality, uh, etc. Laws of nature, etc. 
And the other part is Jalil Kalam, the coerced Kalam. That was the first one was fine Kalam. The second is the coerced Kalam, which is uh, dealt with the theo mainly theological questions, mm -hmm. starting with the divine attributes, etc., res resurrection of the dead and um, uh, Jannah, reward and punishment, afterlife, etc., etc. All this is, you know, is Jalil al-Kalam, which is, and also this made some foundation for the fiqh, Islamic creed and Islamic fiqh. So uh, the first part was interesting for me. I didn't work in Jalil al-Kalam because I thought it was a waste of time, you know, uh, with all respect to those who are working now in Kalam, I would say that Jalil al-Kalam uh, went into very, uh, very delicate uh, areas in the Islamic creed, and that's why it created the problems and created conflicts, Mu'tazila, Ashaira, and then came the question of the Fuqaha who refused this all this uh, approach and they considered it nonsense, uh, which would uh, destroy the Islamic creed, etc., etc. And there were a problem between the Fuqaha, the, the jurisprudence, and the uh, Kalam, and the Mutakallimun. Until in 1900, uh, sorry, in, uh, in 420, uh, Al Qadir Billah, uh, the Caliph, the Abbasi Caliph, Al Qadir Billah, banned Kalam completely, completely. Uh, and he issued, uh, uh, you can say, you can call it now a white paper or whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, you have in England, for example, in Britain, uh, explaining the Islamic, or stipulating rather, the Islamic creed, the principles of Islamic creed, in about 17 pages or so. And this was read for tens of years in the mosques, and uh, the, the peoples who are accused of their and following the Islamic creed, they were examined uh, with this uh, paper, according to the stipulation of the paper. Uh, and from that time, I ca can tell you also that the Islamic common creed in uh, wherever in the Islamic world is almost in the Sunni, uh, in the Sunni, uh, section is uh, following the Al Qadir Billah declaration. It's very, you know, it's very confined, and so they find it very good. I now am trying, uh, as I find the Qiq al Kalam or the subject of natural philosophy in Kalam, in uh, agreement with the with the basic Islamic uh, creed. Also, it's in agreement with the modern physics. Uh, I thought of it could be a chance, you know, to uh, uh, present a proper approach for Islam and science. So I went through studying Kalam books, devoting my time from, I could say, for about four years, from 89 to 94, and I could publish one good paper on the subject in English. It is called The Scientific Value of Daqiq al-Kalam. It was published, by the way, in Pakistan in the, by the Comstic, the, the Islamic Conference and the, the Journal of the, uh, Islamic Thought and Scientific Creativity. The editor was Mudaffar Iqbal, who very much uh, encouraged me, by the way, after reading the manuscript and uh, uh, published it with honor uh, because this is a new discovery for, for them. So here my project start in, in Kalam. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we go back to physics, I continued working in physics, Dr. Shuaib. I continued working in physics and I got uh, my professorship in physics from Yarmouk University in 2003. 
uh, after publishing about seven papers in, in prestigious journals. Most of them are in high quality journals. Uh, but then I could say and admit that I was more inclined to work in uh, Islam and science. I went to, to join the British uh, Science and Religion Forum and I did some work and contributed to many conferences uh, in, in Romania, in uh, France, in Britain, in many areas, in Malaysia lately in 2016, 17, 18, where we met, I think we met in 19, uh, 2018. 18, yeah, it? Uh, yeah. Clicks three. Clicks three, clicks three, yes. So uh, as you see, uh, I continued working and still working in physics, by the way, until now. I'm publishing some works, uh, but I am also um, working heavily in science and religion where I published this, uh, my work. Thank you, by the way, for, for telling people about <laughs> this. This is a very important book, uh, by the way, uh, God, Nature and the Cause. It contains seven chapters and people who will read it, they will find the new, perhaps, perhaps new ideas. Like, for example, there is a big difference between laws of nature and laws of physics. In the West, there is no such difference. When when uh, people, scholars like uh, Paul Davis or even St Stephen Hawking talk about uh, laws of physics, uh, they mean sometimes, uh, or laws of nature, sorry, they mean laws of physics. Uh, and this point, I hope you will give me the chance to clarify here. Uh, the, uh, and this is, by the way, one of the kalam, the benefits of kalam, which is not found in the in the Greek philosophy or the even the the classical philosophy, uh, uh, the European classical philosophy. It's not no such dif difference is shown. Laws of nature is the phenomena without any specific description or reasoning, like saying fire burns cotton. When you put cotton in the fire, it goes on burning. When you uh, have a candle approaching a piece of cotton, the cotton will go, will be set on fire, mm. burning. That's it, full stop. This is a law of nature. Free fall. If I throw this pen from my hand, it will fall toward the ground, finished. No gravity, no why it is falling, etc. This is a law of nature. But when you devise from your uh, chemical uh, background or uh, physical chemistry, uh, an explanation why the cotton is set on fire, and you start talking about molecules being excited to higher energy level and causing dissociation, etc. Exothermic reaction, endothermic. This is physics. And then you are talking about a law of physics. But if you describe the phenomena, whatever it is, even eclipses, lunar eclipse, solar eclipse, when you say, the moon is shadowing the sun, and that is why uh, uh, the uh, eclipse is happening, solar eclipse, covering the face of the sun. Uh, that's why it becomes dark during the day. Uh, that is what you are giving here, a law of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, you can obviously, like the Babylonian has done, prepare uh, tables, how many eclipses per year and how many eclipses in 19 years, Cyrus, and you did use the Cyrus uh, cycle, uh, etc. Uh, this is all law of nature. As long as you don't give an explanation, a physical explanation, you are still in the law of nature. But when you talk about the explanation, it, it becomes a law of physics. Why? What's the difference then? 
law of nature will never change fire will always burn cotton eclipse will always happen but law of of physics may change it perhaps you know it some time ago in the 18th century 19th century they were uh, suggesting that, that there is a fluid in the matter called the fluid stone yeah yeah to explain thermodynamic behavior of uh, and burning etc but now nobody believes in fluid stone theory it's completely changed also they were taking thermodynamics in the old uh, picture and now it turned the uh, quantum theory interfered and changed also uh, other laws of physics newton's law of motion for example are different from einstein newton's law of motion laws of physics einstein general relativity especially the laws of physics but falling body <laughs> freely falling body is the law of nature this is a, a very important difference because now you you, you uh, uh, hear stephen hawking or paul davis for example also in his book the mind of god is talking about he says or kraus uh, lawrence kraus says given the laws of physics the universe can create itself without the need for a creator ah given the laws of physics this is wrong this is wrong Hello. it doesn't you should differentiate between the laws of physics and laws of nature and uh, the laws of physics change by the way as i said which laws of physics you are talking about which laws of physics is it the laws of physics according to newton and the classical mechanics classical physics or is it a new quantum theory or is it uh, the laws of physics uh, in in 200 years time mm -hmm. so the creation of the universe is something is a natural event that has happened we have to explain it but sometimes uh, we cannot explain it within the available uh, jargon of of uh, laws of so yeah, Professor Bothell, yeah. on that point that you just raised, uh, Barack, um, he's mentioned this question, um, or rather this point, rather. He says that the generalization, I were to look how to define, used in laws of, laws of nature is specified in the laws of physics. Otherwise, there'd be many independent, unrelated laws of nature. What would you say to that? No, of course, if you, this is philosophizing, you can say, yeah. Philosophy reaches uh, into what, what's the target? It's to reach a general laws. So you can, nothing wrong with that. You can collect many phenomena in a framework of laws, of what? Of physics, in that case. Mm -hmm. And this is the relation between physics and philosophy, by the way. You, you will have, I agree, you will have, if you talk about laws of nature, you might have many laws of nature subscribing to the same laws of law of physics because law of physics is a philosophy actually mm -hmm. it is i mean a philosophy in the sense that it is a generalization of the of the explanation for the phenomena and therefore knowing the parameters uh, which are playing uh, in, in generating such a, a phenomena Yes, I agree with uh, what he ha I have said, but to note that the laws of physics are the generalization. Right. And this is no, no, no contradiction in this case. No contradiction. Right. But we have to make difference. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, yeah. Go ahead, Professor. I was, I was saying that Barack, I hope that addressed your point. Um, so, Professor uh, Basel, in addition to uh, the distinction that you've raised, um, uh, what was the reason why you wrote this book more more broadly? Is it because you wanted to kind of show that uh, the Kalamic tradition has something to offer? Or was this, a, you know, just a personal exercise that you wanted to put to paper? What was your motivation in writing this book? Yeah, exactly. The motivation was uh, multi-purpose, actually. 
first mm -hmm. to show that kalam could be daqiq uh, al kalam kalam in nature uh, would be possible to utilize the principles of kalam into a possible role in science and religion debates and also to solve some problems in philosophy in the philosophy of science for example you know it the problem of measurement in quantum mechanics it is an outstanding stumbling block actually in the advancement of 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 physics now of theoretical physics this right. question of uh, measurement part of it only is the problem of uh, Hawking paradox, the information paradox, is, is only part of the measurement problem. Actually. The main question is uh, how to identify the unitarity and time reversibility, as uh, uh, some other physicists put it. The reversibility of time are the laws of physics, uh, reversible in time, most of them, yes. Uh, are the laws of nature reversible in time? Not always. Sometimes it is not reversible in time. Some, some laws of nature. Although, as a law of physics, it should be reversible. As a law of physics. That's to say, if you put T goes to minus T, it will give you the same, the same result. Uh, this is one target. The other is to, uh, as I said, correct some of the... Uh, that's why the first chapter in the book goes in Daqiq al-Kalam, a possible role in science and religion debates. The second chapter, Laws of Nature and Laws of Physics, where I discussed th thoroughly. And the third target was to clarify some misunderstanding, unfortunately, about the, uh, the, the Islamic creed and the Islamic Kalam. You know, the subject of causality uh, here needs also correction. Uh, it is believed that uh, that Ash'arites or Mutakallimun in general uh, negate causality altogether. But this is not right. When you go and study in detail their argument, including Al-Ghazali in his book, The Incoherence of the Philosophers, if you read the text properly and full text, not only read the first paragraph or second paragraph, you should read the whole text. And this is what Frank Griffel, thanks Frank Griffel, is doing now in his book about Al-Ghazali. He also clarified part of the, the problem there accusing Ghazali of uh, negating, refusing causality altogether. This is not the case. Mutakallimun refused causal determinism, not causality altogether. What's the difference, you may ask me? I tell you, causality is two parts. Causal relationships and causal determinism. Again, fire burns cotton. This is a causal relationship. You cannot deny that sometimes, you know, uh, there is no relationship between fire and the event of burn. You cannot deny that. Nobody can deny that. Even Al-Ghazali has brought this, this uh, example, by the way. That's why I'm using it. But whether Whenever you have fire and cotton, the cotton will be burned. This is something else. No, the answer is no, not whenever. Not, not compulsory, not necessarily. That's why Al-Ghazali started his, you know, his... Uh, the 17th paragraph, chapter. Yeah, his chapter about uh, causality by saying, this is not necessary. Mm. Negating, denying the causal determinism. And this is what quantum mechanics has taught us. 
that quantum, mecha quantum mechanics is telling us that is there is there are causal relationships, but no causal determinism. The word is indeterministic. Natural laws are indeterministic. Laws of physics may be deterministic. The Schrodinger equation is deterministic. Oh yes, but the laws of nature, and here you can now uh, um, feel the need to differentiate between laws of nature and laws. Laws of nature are indeterministic. The phenomena itself is indeterministic. But the laws of physics describing it, in all cases, I, I think, is indeterministic. And, uh, Professor Basel, here we have a question, again, from Barack. Yes. There are multiple questions. I'm just asking questions relevant to your points as we go along. Yes. But here's another question by Barack. Uh, he says, so causality means occurrence with a high probability? Is that what yes. you could be. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But not mm -hmm. always, by the way, because uh, highest probability events sometimes do not happen. But in most cases, highest probability event happen, as you know, also, uh, Dr. Uh, Shuaib, you are a specialist in physical chemistry and uh, chemical engineering, whatever. It, uh, we have this probabilistic, uh, sorry, we have what's the so-called expectation values. And the expect although expectation values may not necessarily occur, upon a measurement, any given measurement, but most of the result we obtain falls very near or exactly at the expectation value, which is the highest probability event, mm -hmm. which is that. So Barak is correct uh, uh, in, indeed uh, in most cases, but we have to be precocious, you know not to take it, otherwise it will be deterministic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just say, what is the highest probability? This event, then this event must happen. It's not that, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Basel, I'll give you an example we... in the sun, Should for example. Yeah, and it's a very important example. In the sun, when uh, uh, hydrogen fuses into helium and helium get fusing into carbon, the carbon, uh, also fuses to produce oxygen. The probability is very low. Probability of such an event is very low, but it occurs. It occurs, uh, and this is one of the one of the problems in fine tuning and uh, questions. Why should one uh, one one in a thousand uh, probability would occur? This is very strange. Obviously, people, as theists, would say, ah, oh, just to forgot to make uh, oxygen available to us. <laughs> but atheists would say, no, uh, this is also a natural event, and I can explain it by the quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics allows for such an event, uh, low probability event to, uh, to happen. It's not always that uh, the highest probability will occur. Yeah. I'm sorry. So no, no, absolutely. I think people are enjoying this. So we're getting a lot of questions for you, Professor Basel. So uh, before we move on to your second book, because um, I think you've kind of uh, done very well for summarizing this book, um, we just need a few um, questions that need uh, addressing. So let me start off with... Okay, let me start off with this one. Um, this is by Rashid uh, Ben, uh, ben Uda. He's saying, is causality necess necessarily related to a time chronology because assuming the Big Bang is the beginning of time, the question of what caused the Big Bang will be irrelevant. What would you say to that? Yeah, well, uh, uh, yeah, in our, what we call time-like universe, we are living in, in it. Chronological uh, progression is a must. Otherwise, we'll be non-causal. If you live in a, what we call space-like universe, Causality, uh, the causal progression and chronology will be reversed actually or irrelevant. Irrelevant. But as long as our time like universe is concerned, yes. 
the question whether whether the big bang marks an event or not has been discussed by Quentin Smith uh, and uh, Adolf Grumboom, the American philosopher. Uh, uh, and they claim, especially Grumbaum, he has a, 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 an article, very, very strong article. He says the Big Bang, the moment of the Big Bang, does not qualify to be an event. Because there is no time to talk about. So, yeah, this is one respectable view that uh, there is no cause. Uh, mm. There is no cause for the event, not necessarily. But this obviously comes against the Kalam cosmological argument of Craig. Uh, uh, by the way, in my opinion, the Craig Kalam cosmological argument is now, to me, is, uh, is uh, old fashioned and uh, perhaps obsolete. Because the new Kalam co uh, <laughs> cosmological argument is. Uh, uh, related to the indeterminism and causality uh, in this respect. Uh, uh, it says, uh, I have a new formulation actually, which, uh, which, uh, which questions the uh, agency uh, playing with the, uh, with the probabilities, with the choice of mm -hmm. the probabilities as you know, a quantum system, any system, a quantum system has many different, uh, uh, different, let us say, uh, states, and each state has a probability. Uh, as I said, since the highest probability does not always occur, and sometimes low probability event occur, low probability states occur, therefore the question arises, who is playing with the probability? Uh, by the way, Paul Davis has already raised this question in his book, Accidental Universe. The Accidental Universe. Paul, Paul Davis, I know him since 1975, by the way. He was a friend mm -hmm. of my supervisor, Jay uh, Dauker, in Manchester. And he used to visit us and we went into some discussions uh, uh, about these topics, very short discussions, while I, while I see him uh, with my... And that's why I couldn't work as a postdoctor with him, uh, because we have completely, at that time, different opinions. Uh, but now, perhaps, he is much uh, nearer to, to uh, a common, let us say, ground uh, on certain topics in science and religion. So, uh, Professor Basel, on the point about you know, the Big Bang, we have a question by Murad. Um, he's saying, uh, you said something about before the Big Bang, but isn't the Big Bang the start of time? If it is, what does before the Big Bang even mean? So I, I think this is related to what you just said, but yes. also what you stated earlier about your research, which you did in your PhD. What do we mean by the time before the Big Bang? Mm. Uh, the actual point of the Big Bang is the birth, is the birth moment of the black body radiation law or effect, black body radiation. Before that, we have a very short time, very, very short time, 10 to the power minus 43 seconds or something like that, during which the time existed, real time, not the imaginary time of Hawking Harter. No, it's the real time. And space existed before time, by the way. The time is an emergent phenomena in our cosmology. There may be other, other theories. The time existed, but the moment of the Big Bang is a moment forming massive particles. So in the beginning, by the way, if you go to my thesis, or other works, also similar works, with some differences in details. We have differences in details. But if you go to my paper, which is published in 1978, Physical Review, you can see there that there were a time, the time emerged 
and there were interaction between the vacuum, virtual states, no real states, until the vacuum started forming massive particles. Massive particles started uh, absorbing and emitting radiation, electromagnetic radiation, real electromagnetic radiation. They could, they could interact. And at this moment, the Big Bang happened. And in my uh, calculation, you can see that the starting temperature is not infinite, actually. It is 10 to the power 32 Kelvin. Some people would say this is too large and uh, could be, not, but this is not infinite. This is not infinite. And it is not, it's higher than the Gamo, uh, George Gamo, uh, 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 starting temperature of 10 to the power 12 Kelvin, uh, but actually it is the starting temperature for the Big Bang is 10 to the power 32 uh, Kelvin. In other paper, I uh, proved actually with a colleague uh, from Jordan, this was published in 2002, uh, I proved that this temperature 10 to the power 32 Kelvin, which many particle physicists, of course, ad, un, endorse, is the critical temperature at which radiation will be converted into uh, massive particles, massive vector bosons. Uh, through which phenomena? Through the phenomena of Bose-Einstein condensation. But you will say Bose-Einstein condensation is well known to be a low temperature phenomena. It happens in liquid helium, where liquid helium separates into two, two fluids. One is called helium-3 superfluid and one helium-4, correct? But when you go to curved space-time, as one of the scientists uh, spoke about it, low temperature phenomena tends to be a high temperature phenomena. And this was uh, has happened. Many other people followed my paper and wrote a new work uh, and showed that it could cause the inflation, for example. I mean, one, one idea was proposed that this Bose-Einstein condensate, what is a condensate? It is actually all the photons occupy the same state, the very same state. And mind you, photons are bosons. So we can talk, we can talk about many bosons, many photons occupying the very same state. But we can't do the same with electrons, for example, or protons, because they are fermions. And Pauli would, uh, would not agree with us. He would say, no two, no two fermions can occupy the same state. Uh, but we have bosons, thank God. It is... The photons are bosons. That's why they can make a condensate. Uh, actually, two papers were published in the United States proposing by one well-known scientist, Leonard Parker. You know, and uh, this is a great person who was the first to talk about particle creation in the gravitational field before Hawking, by the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, he did uh, work with his student uh, uh, to show that uh, the condensate would qualify to be a cause of inflation. But not many physicists take this uh, seriously. They stick to the so-called false vacuum, and the false vacuum would generate some kind of a potential, which they call inflaton. Uh, and, well, okay. We, we believe that our proposal for Bose-Einstein condensation is more realistic. Mm. Uh, it's something that can be verified, that has been already verified experimentally in low temperature physics. So, uh, but uh, flaton uh, has not been even found until now, which is a 100% theoretical proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, although, the, 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 the uh, theory of inflation solves some problems 
inherent in the standard big band uh, nevertheless uh, there are other models which i have also devised with my student uh, with usama ahmed uh, uh, which shows that uh, we we don't we, if we if we follow a different approach we don't need to problems of our our model our big bang model you can say uh, is free from the problems of standard big bang which is the flatness problem the horizon problem the magnetic monopole problem etc which were solved yes i agree it's solved by the inflation theory but in that case in in our case we don't need deflation at all it mm -hmm. uh, it goes as a smooth, you know, expansion of the universe, obviously with acceleration in the beginning, and then it could go two, three, uh, two or three uh, fates. One fate is the closed universe, as you know, one fate is the flat universe, and one fate is the hyperbolic, etc. This is very complicated technical stuff, but can be simplified, by the way. It's not that that uh, hard to grasp uh, these ideas. Uh, we have uh, one more question, Professor Basel, and then we'll move on to your second book. Uh, Abrar is asking, um, how will you answer the interaction of the immaterial God with the material world? Isn't this yeah. simply, is it, doesn't this imply a change in the state of the eternal? No, actually I have, uh, uh, tackle this question in chapter four as far as in Bar yes, it is chapter four of this book uh, uh, God, Nature and the Cause Ac uh, Divine Action from a Modern Islamic Perspective modern Islamic. but mind you what I mean by modern Islamic perspective is my my own perspective and that is the Qiqr Kalam I believe that God interferes in the universe uh, uh, through recreation. Recreating the world or its parts, and this is a vast subject, recreation, causes uh, or uh, uh, give, give the chance for a change. Recreation, by the way, happens at a very high rate, very high rate. For example, if you calculate, according to my proposal here, uh, if you calculate the frequency or the rate at by which an electron, which is a very light object, is recreated, it is 10 to the power 21. That is to say, the electron is being recreated with all its properties 10 to the power 20 times a second. So you can imagine. Now, I attribute all changes from genetic mutations to uh, electronic transitions in atoms to anything. Uh, to recreation because this is the means by which you can uh, you can achieve a change and this change might be taken or could be taken as an infinitesimal the benefit is from recreation theory uh, I call it hypothesis by the way it's not yet a theory it's a hypothesis the recreation hypothesis says that Every observable, in the physical sense, every observable is subject to be recreated. Second, that the recreation rate or frequency is proportional to the ener total energy of the system. This is a very important result, by me, which I have taken it further and further to try to solve the question of uh, measurement in quantum, including this double slit experiment. I mean, for example, one genius scientist, Richard Feynman, was uh, puzzled with the double slit experiment. He was so much puzzled to say that 
If anyone says or claim that he understands quantum mechanics, you must be sure that he knows nothing about quantum mechanics. <laughs> I wonder if, if this applies to Feynman himself. <laughs> I mean, it's too hard uh, for me. But now we understand that, yes, he was right in the sense that some quantum phenomena has no, no explanation. Some quantum not phenomena, results, even results, has no explanation. And as you know, it is a w w outstanding problem. Uh, yeah. Professor Basel, I think we have more questions for this book. So I think what we'll do is we'll focus on the questions related yeah. to this, and then we'll have a second session where we'll discuss your other book. I think that'll be yeah. more appropriate so people can spend more time. So Indeed. there are a few more questions that I wanted to ask you. Some really good questions are coming out. We have Imad here. He's asking the question, how do you correlate the recreation hypothesis with the predestination and the free will question? How do you do that? How do you salvage uh, free will in your system? Uh, this is subject of the of Jalil al Kalam mm -hmm. These questions are part of uh, theology, destination, etc. And frankly speaking, I have not qualified Jalil uh, Jalil al Kalam or the al Kalam to discuss uh, topics in Jalil al Kalam. Mm -hmm. among which is the uh, final destiny, the, the predestination, free will, all these are subject of uh, a different trend, which is Jadid al-Kalam. I will, I will try to qualify Daqiqa, it should, uh, in a new Jadid al-Kalam. I have my, my project include, but I should admit that it is not my uh, uh, work that will lead to formulate such. I need the help of many other people who are theologians, who are philosophers, who are uh, beside my my basis of in the people. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's not me who will, will achieve such a, a goal, I think. Mm -hmm. That's fair enough. That's an honest answer. We have a question here, and this is now in maybe a slightly different perspective than when you've adopted. We have a bra who's asking, uh, do you agree with Ibn Taymiyyah that God is ever active to tackle this problem? So, you know, God is, he's always kind of, you know, yeah, up, sure. all this goes. Qayyum, you see, this is the point. Allah Qayyum the, the, is the sustainer of all the world. This is basic of the Islamic creed. Nobody can deny this. And this mm -hmm. actually was the motiv what motivated Mutakallimun to suggest recreation. Mm -hmm. as, as it was also that having an omniscient, omniscient God, uh, omnipotent God, uh, being able to do anything at any time, suggested indeterminism, according to Mutakallimun. No Mutakallimun has, as I said, in, in Daqiq al-Kalam has five principles. Uh, atomism, temporality, uh, recreation, indeterminism, space-time integrity. These five principles, they can, through these five principles, explain every other phenomena in, the, in the nature. But these are principles, proposed, hypotheses, you can say, that the world is discrete, that the world is temporal, has a beginning in time, that the world is, that everything is in the world is recreated, and that the laws of nature, not of physics, laws of nature are indeterministic, and that space and time have to be treated on equal footing. No space can exist without time, and no time can exist without space. Mm -hmm. That that is this what we mean by space time integrity on the conceptual level. Mm -hmm. But whether this is a, a forerunning uh, concept uh, in the in the uh, kalam, uh, forerunning concept of relativity, or you can say that yeah, space time. 
is also in relativity is also integrated. In, in the theory, I mean, of relativity, it is integrated. Right. And there is no absolute time, by the way. Ibn Hazm says, Ibn Hazm clearly says that in his book, Al Fisar fil Bilal wal Nihal. And you know, Ibn Hazm was for century uh, for after Hijra. Uh, his 10th century uh, uh, faqih, uh, actually, I consider him. He's not a mutakallim. But he said clearly that we don't accept absolute time. We don't accept uh, accept absolute space. These concepts do not exist in yeah. our argumentation. Or, uh, and he means kalam actually in this respect because he agree with Mutakalim at this point. At this point, but he disagrees on other points mm -hmm. to, to make We're things clear. So, Professor Basel, we're going to take one more question. Uh, and this is a question that I think, uh, I mean, it's an interesting one. It's a difficult one. It's Barack again. He's asking, doesn't the recreation model make causality obsolete? It makes for sure causal determinism obsolete, but not causality. Causal relationship will be maintained. Mm -hmm. Causal relationship will be relationships will be maintained but causality uh, causal determinism no it will be obsolete yes of course mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right hopefully that answers your question so uh professor Basel, i think we'll end it there uh and yes. hopefully we'll pick up a second session so that we can maybe have a round of your Yes, second book that you published certainly. so for the people who are watching um if you look at the bottom link i've put in three links there one is uh professor boss's university profile so you can see all the publications that he has uh, written over the past few years uh, or decades i might add um, and then i've also added the amazon links for both of these books so his his book that we discussed today which is god nature and the cause this was published in 2016 and his very recent publication, this is published just a year ago or two years ago, The Divine Word and the Grand Design. And we'll hopefully have a second session where we go into the details of this. Uh, you discuss, I think, much, many more topics here like evolution, fine-tuning, design, uh, right? So, uh, Professor Basel, thank you very much for your time. For the people who have tuned in, thank you so much for you know your attendance and your engagement. We hope you benefited a lot. Uh, please do check out his works. You know, he's a very uh, prolific uh, author. And he's doing a lot of interesting stuff between Islam and science, trying to relate physics with, you know, uh, some of the works that the Mutakalimin have written on. Uh, Professor Basel, if people have questions, can they contact you? Would you be okay oh, yes, with that? Of course. With... You can give them my email. Mm -hmm. if, you like, if you also put the email, no, no problem. And I have my YouTube channel, as you perhaps yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can yeah. easily get the, the URL by on YouTube, Basil. Mm -hmm. Altai, Basil, okay. Altai, immediately you will get the channel. Most of the uh, published videos are in Arabic, mm -hmm. but some videos are in English. Mm -hmm. There are quite uh, a few uh, in English, including arguments uh, 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 against uh, Stephen Hawking, Lawrence Krauss, Tyson. Tyson also once was speaking about Al Ghazali accusing him, etc., of destroying yeah. the Islamic, uh, the Islamic civilization, etc. So I had to clarify that point in a video. Yes. Right. Okay. It's already there. And Perfect. also uh, many many videos about Kalam and my my seminars or in in uh, Malaysia, if you remember them. Yes, I remember that the recording that you did. It was actually a, a, a point by point principle of your chapter, right? This is exactly. what you were discussing. Yeah. yeah, I remember. I remember that one. Okay, so we'll add all that, and hopefully, if you guys want to reach out to him, uh, feel free to you know message me, and I'll hopefully send you his contact details. But yeah. uh, thank you so much once again, Professor Basel. For the people watching, thank you. Uh, we'll hopefully update the details of when we're having Professor Basel again. Thank you so much. All of you yeah. have a wonderful evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.